Hi, and welcome to lesson four on flying qubits and stationary memories. This is the first lesson out of three where we look at quantum hardware that we're going to need in order to build a quantum network. In the first step, we're going to look at photonic qubit representation. So photons are excellent carriers of information. They move from one node to the other. That's why we also call them flying qubits. And they're good at their job because they're fast, they keep very long coherence times, and they hardly interact with the environment. So when we encode uh, um, our coherent information into a photon, we have a good chance that we're going to recover this uh, information at the end of its journey. Also, photons can operate in room temperature. Unlike other quantum systems that we're going to talk about in this lesson, the quantum memories, they don't need to be cooled to very low temperatures. And also, they can be manipulated with very simple means using linear optical elements such as beam splitters, phase shifters, and polarizers. But there are some disadvantages associated with photons. The first one is that somehow we need to produce them and detect them. Producing and detecting single photons is very inefficient, very technologically challenging. For example, when we want to uh, produce a single photon on demand, we would just like to have a box where we press a button and an exactly single photon comes flying out. This is not always the case. Producing them on demand is challenging, but also producing exactly one photon uh, is very difficult too. Usually we have a distribution uh, where we have a probability of producing zero photons, other probability producing one photon, but also higher number of photons such as two and three. Also, coupling photons into a fiber is quite challenging. Once we produce the photon, there is no guarantee that it will couple to a fiber and travel uh, uh, towards the distant node of a quantum network. So there are some inefficiencies associated there as well. And lastly, we talked about this before already, but there's attenuation in optical fibers. So as photons travel, there's a high probability that they will get lost if the distance gets too long. Now, what is a good representation for a photonic qubit? So far, we have talked about qubits in the abstract representation. We talked about the computational basis, 0 and 1. We talked about the exit basis, which is a superposition of 0 and 1. So we had the plus and the minus states. When we wanted to manipulate the qubit, we were using the Pauli um, x, z, and y, ma y matrices. And also we were changing going from computational basis into the X basis using Hadamard operation. But this tells us nothing about the actual physical implementation. That's what this step is about. The first representation is quite natural and it uses the polarization degree of freedom of a photon. Let's rewind and look at the classical picture of an electromagnetic wave. Over here, we've got an electromagnetic wave that has uh, this blue horizontal component and this red vertical component. And it's incident on a polarizer oriented in the horizontal direction. That means that only the blue horizontal component can pass through the polarizer. Similarly, if you rotate the polarizing to its vertical configuration, then it's only the red vertical component of the electromagnetic wave that can passes through. And this basic intuitive picture carries also uh, to the quantum level of single photons we're going to um, denote the horizontally polarized state as H and the vertically polarized state as V. So let's uh, imagine that we have a train of single photons uh, polarized either in the vertical direction, those are these red photons, or the horizontal direction, those are these blue photons. Again, if they're incident on a horizontal polarizer, only the horizontal photons are allowed to pass through. If we rotate the uh, polarizer into its vertical configuration, then it's only the red vertical photons that go through. So in this way, we can perfectly distinguish the two states from each other. In other words, mathematically, what we're doing is we're taking the inner product and we see that it vanishes. It goes to zero. That means that the H and V is a good basis, uh, is an orthonormal basis that we can use to encode any state of a qubit. So we write, the state psi is alpha times h plus beta times v. But this is not the only basis that we can use. We can also use rotated bases. In particular, we can use the diagonal and anti-diagonal states as our basis. So the diagonal state is given as an equal superposition of h and v. 
and the anti-diagonal state is also an equal superposition, but with a minus sign uh, in front of the v state over here. Similarly, we can also use complex numbers as a relative phases. When we do h plus iv, we get the right circularly polarized state. If we do h minus iv, we get the left circularly polarized state. You may uh, think that this notation is quite familiar, and in fact it is. We can just replace that h and v with 0 and 1, and re we recover the z basis over here, or the x basis for the diagonal anti-diagonal states, or the y basis for the right and left circular states. That allows us to represent the state of a polarization qubit on a sphere as well. Recall the representation of a block sphere that tells us of what state the qubit is in. Zero is at the top, one is at the bottom, and the corresponding states are uh, at, in the horizontal plane. When we talk about the polarization of a qubit, we, we use the name Poincaré sphere for historical reason. Here, the H is at the top, the vertical polarization state is at the bottom, and the D and A and R and L are in the horizontal um, plane. Now that we know how to encode information into polarization of a qubit, how can we transform the polarization states? And what we use are optical elements known as wave plates. These are bifringent elements, usually made from quartz or mica, and the defining property of a wave plate is that its refractive index depends on the polarization of the electromagnetic wave or of the photon. Recall that the refractive index tells us how fast the electromagnetic wave propagates through the material. So let's consider this example over here. We've got a diagonally polarized electromagnetic wave, so it's got a horizontal uh, polarization component and a vertical component, and they are in phase, meaning when the horizontal component reaches its maximum, the vertical component also reaches its maximum. So the total polarization is oscillating along this diagonal. As the wave impinges on the wave plate, as it enters through, we rotate it in such a way that the horizontal component does not change speed, but the vertical does. You can see that the blue horizontal component completes one cycle of oscillation, while the horizontal component completes one and a half cycles, so it is slowing down. So by the time it exits the wave plate at this point over here, the waves have the components uh, of horizontal and vertical polarization have changed phase. Now when the horizontal component is maximum, the vertical component is minimum. In other words, we have changed the polarization of the wave from diagonal into anti-diagonal over here. So the wave plate allows us to introduce relative phase, it allows us to perform arbitrary rotations of the polarization, and also the thickness depends, uh, controls how much um, we do these two operations, and the orientation of the wave plate also determines which components get slowed down. Mathematically, we describe the wave plate in the following way. We use two parameters. We use the phi parameter, which controls the phase shift, and the theta parameter, which tells us about the rotation of the wave plate with respect to the HV basis. So when they are aligned, in other words, when theta is equal to zero, the action of the wave plate on the horizontally polarized state is nothing, it's just the identity, it doesn't change it. On the other hand, if we are acting on the vertically polarized state, we are introducing a phase e to the i phi. If we set the phase shift to be exactly pi, we can explore what's the effect of this parameter theta. If we are acting on the horizontally polarized state, then we rotate it in the hv plane, given controlled by the angle theta. Similarly, we uh, rotate the vertically polarized state as well. Half wave plates are elements which allow us to transform linear to linear polarization, like we did in our previous example, when we went from diagonal to anti-diagonal, while quarter wave plates allow us to transform linear polarization to circular polarization. Now that we know how to transform polarization qubits, how do we actually measure them? And we will start with single qubit measurements. We have already seen how we can do it with polarizers. We've got our uh, arbitrary polarization encoded qubit over here, hitting a, vertic a horizontally oriented polarizer. And we place a single photon detector after the polarizer. The chance that the detector clicks is related to the probability amplitude alpha. It's just mod alpha squared. 
Similarly, if we rotate the polarizer uh, to its vertical direction, the chance that the uh, detector will click is given by mod beta squared. This is not the only way of measuring a single polarization qubit. We can also use something known as a polarizing beam splitter. This is another bifringent element that splits the two polarizations. So the horizontal polarization just carries through, it gets transmitted, while the vertical polarization gets reflected and goes down. All we have to do then is to place two, um, two de single photon detectors at the end, and each will click with the corresponding probabilities. For the, horizontally, for, for the horizontal path, we get mod alpha squared, while for the vertical path, we get mod beta squared. Another important measurement, especially in quantum networking, quantum communication, is the Bell basis measurement. Recall that we use this um, extensively in quantum repeater networks. For that, we're going to need one beam splitter, two polarizing beam splitters, and four detectors. And this is the configuration. These arms at the bottom represent incoming photons, either from the left, uh, from the left and from the right. So they are photons coming from two distant nodes. They are incident on this beam splitter, which mixes them. And then on each side, we've got one polarizing beam splitter and two detectors. Now, the basic thing about doing uh, Bell basis measurements within linear optics is that we can only distinguish two of the four uh, Bell pairs. So this is a fundamental limitation. It has nothing to do whether we're being smart and how we can measure it. This is a fundamental limitation of linear optic elements. So the probability of success is given by a half. And this is assuming ideal detectors with unit efficiency, which is not the case in the real world. Uh, detectors have some finite efficiency given by the parameter eta. And because the, we're looking for a pattern where two detectors are supposed to click on each side, then the probability of success is given by half times eta squared. So that concludes the representation of using polarization we're going to talk about the second representation for qubits, and that's given by time bin encoding. This way, we don't use an internal degree of freedom of the photon, such as the polarization, we use the arrival time. So when our photon arrives early, denoted by this ket e, then we say this represents a logical zero. On the other hand, if the photon arrives in a later time bin, represented by this ket l, then this represents a logical one. We have to be careful how um, we spread the time bins and what's the time separation between them. We must ensure that this time separation is much larger than the coherence time of the photon. Imagine if these two encodings were too close to each other and then we get a click somewhere in the middle. We cannot tell uh, with certainty whether we got an early photon or a late photon. This is the scheme how to encode superpositions using uh, an unbalanced interferometer. We start with a, a normal photon and the unbalanced interferometer is represented over here. It's unbalanced because the lower arm is shorter than the upper arm. This variable coupler controls how much is transmitted and how much uh, of the photon is reflected, what's the probability of transmission and what's the probability of reflection. And this phase phi, this phase shifter over here, introduces a an, um, relative phase. Then the two arms are combined back together at this switch, and the resultant state of the photon is given in this following way. It's a superposition of the early and late basis states, and the superposition, the probability amplitudes, are given by the variable coupler settings over here. And the relative phase e to the i phi is controlled by this phase shifter in the longer arm. There's a, it may seem like a complicated scheme to do compared to the polarization photons, but there are some very significant advantages to using time bin encoding. First of all, it's very robust against decoherence. As we send polarization photons through a long fiber, they may lose their polarization. So we have to use uh, more expensive polarization preserving fibers. This is not the case for time bin encoding because we, are, we don't care about the polarization photon, only about its arrival time. That's why it's very suitable for long distance communication. In fact, experiments have been performed in fiber and in free space over very, very long distances. 
in free space, we were able to encode quantum information and send it from Earth to lower Earth orbit as well as middle Earth orbit. And lastly, the crucial Bell basis measurement. For that, we only need one beam splitter and two detectors. So the scheme is quite, um, quite simpler compared to the polarization encoding. Again, we've got the photons from distant nodes coming in. They mix at the beam splitter and then we, uh, uh, we measure the state and which state we measure is given by the pattern of clicks that are observed. However, again, we are facing the fundamental limitation that we can only distinguish two of the four Bell pairs. And with detectors with quantum efficiency given by eta, the overall probability of success is given by one half times eta squared. So that concludes our discussion of the two representations of flying qubits. In the next step, we're going to look at quantum memories, which are also called stationary qubits. See you there.